Five Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hey folks, today is Monday, November 14th, 2022. Roland Martin Unfiltered coming to you live from Houston. We're streaming on the Black Star Network on today's show, Georgia. Hugely critical. Democrats now control the United States Senate as a result of a win in Nevada, but Georgia is still a crucial race. Uh, we'll talk to a grassroots organization. We'll talk about the importance of that, but also what happened, Carolina? Why didn't Sherry Beasley campaign mobilize and organize the North Carolina A and T and other HBCUs? We'll break that thing down. Also, major issues happening in Haiti. We'll talk to a reporter who's been covering uh, the chaos uh, on the ground there. Also, a white teacher here in Texas loses his job. Why? Because he's a white supremacist. Uh, we'll talk about that on today's show. Plus, Malcolm Nance will join us, counterterrorism expert, talking about Russia, Ukraine, and how the religious right is trying to drive a wedge in American politics. It is time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Side Network. Let's go. He's got it, whatever the miss, he's on it, whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine, and when it breaks, he's right on time, and it's rolling, best believe he's knowing, putting it down from sports to news to politics, with entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling, Folks, big wins over the weekend in Arizona and Nevada, now putting Democrats over the top. They will retain control of the United States Senate uh, as a result of uh, the re-election of incumbents in Arizona and Nevada. But the focus still is on Georgia, where Senator Raphael Warnock is running against Herschel Walker. Now, there's some people who are saying, oh, now because of Arizona and Nevada, Georgia is not as uh, important. Uh, well, we disagree. It is still critically important, uh, and that could mean a 51-49 advantage for Democrats. Um, Hillary Holly joins us right now, uh, Care in Action, Executive Director. They have one a grassroots organization out there uh, fighting the good fight. Hillary, glad to have you here. Before I get to Georgia, i got to talk about North Carolina. Uh, I saw a tweet over the weekend uh, that just jumped out at me, and I was like, what the hell? Uh, in that tweet, uh, y'all said that um, y'all had an activation on the campus of North Carolina A&T, and many of the students there had no clue that Shira Beasley was even running for the United States Senate. I'm sorry, North Carolina A&T is the largest HBCU in the country. How in the world can you be a black woman running for the United States Senate and you're not organizing HBCU campuses like North Carolina A&T? Tell us what y'all saw and experienced on the ground in North Carolina. That, that that just was shocking to me. Yeah, well, first, I want to say thank you for having me on the show. It's such an important conversation. You know, I, as a Southern girl, what I saw happen in North Carolina reminded me of what I saw in 2018 in Georgia. And a lot of political strategists in North Carolina, they, they, they presented a false choice. Either mobilize Black people or focus on white moderates that might can't come back and vote Democratic. And one of the most important things, one of the biggest takeaways for North Carolina at this moment is we can never use false choice. We have to always, no matter what we're doing, even if we think we can pull off a few white moderate people, 
We always have to focus on our base, y'all. We always have to make authentic con con um, connections with black and brown people in every area of the state. And we have to be bold about it. We can't be scared about what they're saying. We have to take care of our people first and center them. And that doesn't mean that we ignore white people. It just means that we take care of home. And then we have some side conversations on people who might be leaning either way. And so I think that's what I saw on the ground in North Carolina. I saw some people buy into false choice. Um, and so because of that, there were so, and y'all, <laughs> I remember at that event, it was packed. Like they wanted attention to the point where I had to reorganize my staff. We had to reorganize our table because so many students were coming up and they were thrilled that we were there. And so I think the takeaway, like I said, you have to take care of our base. This isn't, we have to choose one or the other. We have to do all the things, especially in purple states like North Carolina. And that means taking home of people. And, and, we, and we, have to, we have to always be in our black communities, no matter what. Um. Uh, you're going you're going in and out a little bit all right okay uh, let's see how's that there we go that's better okay I'm just trying to understand how can you not mobilize black people it is you're a black candidate. And this is just, and I'm just going to say it, and I keep saying it, this is what happens when you have white strategists who say they don't have to focus on black people. You know, I think another, uh, and to your point, when you always have to have people grounding you, and you always have to think about who is around you, right? And when you, when you nationalize a campaign, we, I get it. It takes a lot of money nowadays to run campaigns. So you have to go national. You have to go big. But at the same time, you have to keep people close to you who are who are very connected to the ground, connected to the deep, deep roots of the Black community to ensure, like how you just said, that you don't end up choosing one or the other. And so this is where I think, you know, Hillary Holly, right now, I'm I'm 100% focused on winning the Georgia runoffs. But I think after the, the the Georgia Senate runoffs are over, we have time to rest. There are a lot of conversations we need to have about how you truly mobilize in the South, especially when you have black like black candidates who can win statewide. Um, that needs to be a very intentional conversation, especially going into 2024. And 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 look on that particular point there, Hillary. Um, let's just again be real clear. You got some white strategists who think, "Oh, it's the South; we can never win there." No, you can't win there, but you literally have to mobilize them. I just saw a story today: eight, nine point eight point six million Texans um didn't vote. The total number of eligible Texans is at eleven million. Democrats could literally flip the state if they focus on not. Okay, trying to get as many suburban voters, but if you actually try to turn out the people who aren't even interested, it's eleven million. That, yep. This is in fact and, Beto lost Beto, Beto, Beto lost about eight hundred thousand. If you you ten percent of eleven million, you win. Mm -hmm. And this is one reason why, and 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 you may be seeing me talking a lot about this. I'm. One of my biggest takeaways from this election is grassroots is how. So look, like we're talking about the Democratic committees, and I, I can say this, I can say this very firmly that if it were not for the grassroots outside organization knocking millions and millions of doors in all these communities you're talking about we would be having a very different conversation about who controls the majority. So for example, America Votes is the largest progressive convening table in the country. And so care in action, we, we all work collaboratively. Okay, you're knocking these doors. All right, I'm knocking these doors so we don't overlap each other. 
America Votes made sure that we collectively knocked 30 million doors across the state or across the country. That is how you win. And so what we need is for all entities, whether it's Democratic committees, outside organizations, we always have to ensure that field is number one, knocking doors and having conversations is centered in everything we do. That's how we win. And if everyone incorporates that same model, like you said, it's a numbers game and we can win. Okay, so I want you to, I want you to stay on that because Georgia is tied to it. I was talking to a marketing executive and they were like, look, digital, digital, digital. And I said, you cannot ignore door knocking. People need to be touched. They need to actually physically hear from someone. They want to see someone. And I said, I said, listen, I said, if you are of certain income, you think digital first. I said, we still have a lot of people who live in analog. Mm -hmm. and you got to understand they exist. Talk about that. Yes. So this is actually, you know, um, a lot of conversations I'm having right now where people are planning or putting together their U.S. Senate runoff plans in Georgia. Over, so over half or nearly half of all black voters in the state of Georgia lives outside of the metro Atlanta area. A lot of people like to think, oh, if it ain't Atlanta, it ain't black. That's not true. There are black people all over the state. The one thing about that means is a lot of these black rural folks, they don't have access to broadband because the Republican legislature has continuously not in, chosen not to invest in expanding broadband access. So meaning if we're spending all of our money on digital ads, half of black voters probably aren't seeing them. And when you have a complex, nuanced selection where there are so many issues top of mind, right? And the issues that we're talking about, they're not simple one-liners, right? Talking about inflation, it's a complicated conversation. So to your point, digital ads, they can't talk back and forth. You have to have the human. And that's why one reason why I like the organization that I represent and our partner organization, National Domestic Workers Alliance, we represent 350,000 domestic workers. And when we were thinking about, okay, we have our paid canvas happening, we have, we're knocking hundreds of thousands of doors, what else do we need to do? You know what? Our workers, our workers were actually the best messengers. So we had them fly to North Carolina, Nevada, and Georgia. And in Georgia, we sent them to rural Southwest Georgia because we knew that domestic workers, if they understand the hardships of this country, it's them. And so having them talk one-on-one -on -one with voters, not that, not that voters who they were sure they were gonna vote for Walker or Warnock, they were voters that if they show up, they'll vote for Warnock. So like you said, you have to have conversations. It takes a lot of back and forth and it takes authentic messengers like domestic workers and like in Nevada, the culinary workers, right? They knocked a million doors in Nevada and had a million conversations with ordinary people. So again, it's a yes and. Of course we need digital ads, right? A lot of Americans spend our time on social media, but that one-to-one -one person contact, that seals the deal. And, and also I think by having those individuals who are talking, what they're also doing is they're talking issues. And, mm -hmm. and I, I've had more people ask me over the last few days, Hey man, how do we actually reach these people? And I keep saying, you have to talk issues. I said, you don't come. And in fact, I was in Spokane, Washington, uh, speaking Saturday uh, to the NAACP there. Uh, and so here's the NAACP chapter, and there's few black people in Spokane, like less than two percent. And the room was it was mostly white, and it was a white woman who came up to me and she said she was with the Republican Party there, and she said. You know, we really want to connect with African Americans. And this is what I told her. I said, first of all, you cannot come to black people waving a Republican flag. I said, I'm just telling you right now, that ain't gonna work. I said, what you should be doing is if you want to come talk to black people, you should be talking to black people about issues, mm -hmm. issues that they care about. I said, now there are going to be issues that you support that we ain't down with. I said, but if you lead with issues and not waving your flag, then you probably have a better chance of communicating with us. The flip side is the same thing. Democrats can't just say, 
hey, vote for us because of a D. Vote for Warnock because he's better than Walker. No, you're going to have to explain to people how Senator Raphael Warnock will be better for those rural black folks and rural poor white folks than Herschel Walker. And I think too often these Democratic strategists, and I'm gonna, and again, I don't care. Uh, I think you got too many smart ass white boys, okay, who want to control the money, who think they know better. And I'm sorry, you can't be sitting your ass in Washington, D.C. and think you know how to communicate to a black person in Albany, Columbus, Statesboro, Swainsboro, Athens, Savannah, and you haven't even visited there. Yep. I mean, I remember when the first Herschel Walker abortion, you know, drama came out, I sent, on, honest to God truth, if we're talking truth here, I sent a blast email to a lot of people running independent programs saying, listen, I know we think this is a bombshell, but it's not. It's not. Most people, Black people especially, when they see the Herschel Walker news about oh, all the abortion stuff and baby mamas and like, you know, domestic violence. It's horrible, right? But the follow-up question is, but what is Warnock going to do for me? So I always, I, I, I had to ask people, focus, please. I, I remember one, one time I had to say, listen, going up on TV or taking out digital ads about Herschel Walker's controversies, that's not going to move voters. And if it does, it's going to move a tiny percent of white voters who feel too guilty that, you know, they're like, oh, I can't vote for him. But for our base, Roland, like the people we're talking about, they're like, ooh, that Herschel Walker drama, that's messy. But you know what? I still need to be able to afford the food on my table. So how is war not going to help us do that? And that's exactly what Karen Action was doing. We were talking about the issues. We weren't talking about Herschel Walker drama. We were talking about how Warnock is, in fact, the best candidate on the ticket to help their lives. Okay, so a final question for you. Uh, now we're talking about where we are in Georgia. Look, it's a shortened window. What yes. do you and other grassroots organizations need? Because, again, early voting starts November 28th. Uh, the election is uh, December 6th. You don't have the two months we had in 2020. Literally, we're talking now 23 days. 23 days. I'm going to be very honest. We need money right now, like right now. The beautiful thing, and when I say we need money, I'm talking about our allies, like Black Voters Matter, Asian American Advocacy Fund, Mi Gente, um, CASA, um, all the beautiful local Georgia organizers who talk to our voters 365 days a year. Guess what? Our runoff plans were final weeks ago. We have our plans. We have our universes. We have people knocking doors, making phone calls right now. Like people were literally knocking doors for Warnock this weekend because our coalition is that strong. But in order to scale up as quickly as we need to, people can't sit on their money, right? And, and going back, if a lot of these political strategists, if they really want to help right now, they need to be gavel night, like getting all the funders, giving directly to the organizations, literally like tonight. Because if we don't, if these, some of these organizations don't have money, enough money in their bank accounts to scale as quickly as we need to do and may be as impactful as we are, we're not going to be able to put this over the edge. But I can tell you, because I did it before, <laughs> is if we get the grassroots entities who are knocking doors, the money and resources they need today, we can win this. I know we can do it because it's the same crew of people who did it before. Oh, I absolutely agree. So uh, we're going to do all of our part as well. We'll be there on the ground doing some work with Black Voters Matter uh, and uh, some other organizations. And so uh, I actually sent an email, I actually sent a social media post out uh, telling people that they should contribute to the variety of groups. And so uh, we'll uh, add your organizations to that. Because what I keep saying is, like, if you want to support the Warnock campaign, that's fine. But I said, if you want to actually, if you want the people who are going to be going directly trying to motivate black people, support the grassroots organizations who are out there, boots on the ground, who are not wasting the money uh, on the same television ads. And so uh, we'll add that to it. And so certainly good luck. And uh, I'm sure I'll run, run into you out there when we're in Georgia. Yes. Yes. Thank you again for having me. It means so much. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot.
All right, folks, got to go to break. We come back. We'll talk with our panel, talk about some other issues right here on Roller Mark Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, broadcasting live from Houston, Texas, where uh, in less than an hour, I'm going to be attending a dinner that uh, Prairie View and um, President Ruth Simmons is throwing in honor of Chris Tucker. And so I'm going to be uh, a guest at that, which is also my birthday. So it's a twofer. Uh, so we'll be right back on the Black Star Network. Download the app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also, of course, support us uh, in what we do by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support this show and what uh, we do. And so that is critically important. We appreciate if you can uh, help us with your resources. And don't forget to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available at bookstores everywhere. You can also download it on Audible. We'll be right back. Happy Yo, Earth buy me some time. Nobody it more real and more on money. Thought I was going to cut energy. Unfiltered, they need to, and that's why we love you. Cheers. Happy birthday. election is coming up. It's super important that folks know who they are voting for, but more importantly, what they are voting for. Y'all, we got the free shirts and free lunch right over here. Freedom is our birthright. No matter what we're up against, we're sending a message in Dallas and Texas and in the country. We won't black down. That's what this bus tour is all about. The housing cost is one of the most capitalized areas that we have found people who are marginalized that are brown and black we are suffering the most and i think that we have the biggest vote and the biggest impact in this election i'm voting for affordable housing for sure we should not be paying the cost of a utility failure because our elected officials are too proud to say we need help. I know that we can bring out our people to vote. It's a part of our birthrights. Right. It's a part of our heritage. And surely it's a part of our prison and a part of our future. That's right. That's what's up. And we won't black down. Forward that message to five friends because in that message it's got links to how to get registered, how to check your registration status. Like I said, 2.30, we'll start um, rendezvousing right here on this street. I am voting to let our voice be heard in the rural communities that, hey, we are people, too. There are things that we need. Free shirts, free food, and lots of power. We are in Longview, Texas, where black voters matter, 365. Whatever type of oppression a white supremacist throws our way, we will not black down. We are in relentless pursuit of liberation of our people. Freedom is liberation for black bodies and black communities to make economic change through political power. Freedom is choice. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't black down. We won't well, black yeah, down. We won't black, black down. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Pull up a chair, take your seat in the Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. 
we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Julian Malvo, Dean of College of Ethnic Studies, uh, California State University, Los Angeles, Dr. Amakongo Dabinga, Professorial Lecturer, School of International Service, American University, Renita Shannon, she is a Georgia State Representative. Uh, glad to have all three of you on the show. Renita, I want to start with you. The point that, that we just heard the Hillary make, look, it's ground, 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 ground. Grassroots organizations are critically important. And, and I just think, frankly, that far too many of these white strategists all they focus on is television, television, television. No, we're seeing Nevada and Arizona, those were tight races because people were on the ground going door to door. Tele is not always television and radio. And the other thing is, is that these white strategists are telling them to stay away from issues that um, predominantly affect black people because they're telling them that that is the only way that they can keep the coalition together. So Hillary, Hillary was right. Um, what we need to see are candidates understanding, realizing, and engaging black voters primarily because black voters are the voters that you can consistently count on. Let me, uh, as far as Democrats go, for um, helping to elect them to public office. Now, let me talk to you about what we've uh, seen here in Georgia, just looking at the stats from the recent election, the November 8th election. We have um, about 10 million people here in Georgia. Eight million of them are registered to vote. In our election, November 8th, a little less than four million came out. So that means, and that's between all candidates, yeah. all parties, that's how many voters we had show up to vote on November 8th. So this is a problem of um, we Democrats have got to turn out their voters. That is what will win this election. And so between now and then, we've got to get more of those 4 million folks off of the sidelines willing to come in and to vote for um, Reverend Warnock. Now, the good thing that he has going for him is that we see that Herschel is a soft candidate. Because he, if he had he been a better candidate, he would have coasted to re-election like Brian Kemp did, but uh, that did not happen, and he is in a runoff. So we know that many Republican folks did skip the Senate race, and they moved on to vote for Brian Kemp. So we know that he definitely has some weak spots. But the thing that we have to have here is it's got to be candidates engaging with, or Senator Warnock engaging with the ground game, those grassroots organizations, and really speaking to the issues that are going to make voters understand how important this election is. Um, here's what's something that's interesting, um, Julian. I was, I was I was communicating with Dr. William Reverend Dr. William Barber, and and he sent me this. He's going to be joining us um, on next Tuesday. Uh, and he said that poor and low income voters voted at a similar rate as higher income voters in 2016. They would have matched or exceeded the presidential election margins of victory in 15 states, among them Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. New Hampshire, Arizona, Minnesota, Maine, Florida, New Mexico, North Carolina, Nevada, Georgia, Texas, Mississippi, and Ohio. He said, we also found that the reason poor and low-income voters participate in election rates at elections at lower rates is not because they have no interest in politics, but because politics is not interested in them. They do not hear their needs and demands from candidates or feel that their votes matter. No one talks to them. He said Schumer was on Morning Joe uh, bragging about how he did so much to reach average Americans. He said they're more interested in winning small than winning big. Woo, and that comes from Reverend Barber. First of all, Roland, happy birthday to you. To you, Marianne, and Mariette Malvo, because y'all share a birthday. Those are my twin sisters, but have a wonderful birthday. Um, all right. Now, 
<laughs> to the to the issue. Um, Reverend Barber is, as always, pre pre he's just absolutely right. The challenge has been, and, and Schumer just needs to shut up because, again, you pointed out that Sherry Beasley did not have a ground game at A and T or maybe the guess you had. That's that's criminal. Ten HBCUs in North Carolina, all of them would have come out and drove to her. But one of the things you pointed out, you've been pointing out, do these candidates actually have control of their campaigns, or are these, as you put it, smart-ass white boys, the ones who are running things? I, Reverend Barber and, and Raphael Warnock needs to pay attention to what was said um, by your guests, as well as what's being said here, what's being said by you. You know, I adore, adore Reverend Warnock. Years ago, he gave me some money for Bennett College, so I've never forgotten that. However, is he at Morehouse? Is he at Spelman? Is he talking to the people? I had a man on my radio show this morning, and he was saying, um, it, he was, I, I apparently had been in Georgia, but his whole, he said, what can Warnock do for me? And I laid three or four things out to him. He says, well, he ain't talking to me. He, he's not asking black men for their votes. And that's interesting. Um, I've had another person to talk about Sherry Beasley said the same thing. So here's the deal. You have to talk to people. You can't assume because you're black that black people are going to vote for you. You have to ask black people. You have to show up where we are. You can't take us for granted. We want the same attention the white moderates want. They People want to be heard, they, and they want to be recognized. And I think that all too often, black Democrats who are in le leadership positions sometimes assume that black folks will just come out for black folks. Well, we won't. We want, we want to be stroked, too. And I think that, that Raphael Warnock has an opportunity and the ne necessity to do some stroking in these last 23 days. The point there, Omakongo, you have to ask us for our vote. And again, I, I just, when I saw that tweet, and when they said that these North Carolina a and students, the only thing they knew about Beasley were the negative attack ads from the right, and how no one had organized and mobilized their campus, I, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I literally could not really believe that. I'm going, that, that is so basic. It is literally, it, 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 okay, if I, if I was trying to build the brand awareness for the Black Star Network, the first thing that I'm going to do is probably say, hmm, I'm going to reach out to my Alpha brothers on every HBCU campus in North Carolina and say, let's do something. I, that, that's kind of basic. Yeah. Then if you look at the stats and you see that 70% of young voters voted Democrat on Tuesday, that's a no-brainer. How do you not have a college effort and not just going to Duke and NC State. No, you're also going to the HBCUs. That, to me, Omakongo, I, I just saw that, and I was dumbfounded the same way I was when the black activist in Milwaukee said, yep, we never heard any from anyone with the Mandela Barnes campaign. That, you got two black candidates, and you don't take care of your black base? That, 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 that is... Shockingly stupid. I mean, quite mm -hmm. honestly, and first of all, happy birthday to you, no doubt, man, for real. Uh, I, I, it's quite you, you almost want to say you kind of deserve to lose when you when you do something like that. I don't know any political candidate who does not start with their base. And you talked about seventy percent of the youth vote going Democrat, but let's also remember we have so we have so much energy that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement, particularly coming out of the summer of 2020, you had a lot of these young people who couldn't wait to be of voting age in the last two years, and many of them are voting age now. They're in college right now. So how do you not target them? We've seen across the country that... It's so, and, and Tiffany Lofton talked about it when she was on last week, talking about the youth vote and your other guests. And they were talking about how across the country these young black students are mobilized and they want to do something. But like, we, like Dr. Malbo said, we are human beings too. And sometimes I say to myself, well, I can't imagine why people wouldn't go out and, and, and vote for this person or that person. But it, it is real. We need to be courted. We need to be... No, we need to be. We need to feel like people are not just taking advantage of our vote because, like you said, if all that they're getting are those Beasley negative ads, then that means they've been inundated with 
How many times do the Democrats take the black vote for granted? How many times are you going to just throw your vote away? That's what they were getting that whole time. And what they did was they changed the channel. So when we come to Warnock right now, when we go between now and 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 and, the, and December 6th, if you're not hitting Morehouse, if you're not hitting Spelman, if you're not hitting all of these other places where the youth are, this is your election to lose. And there are other people out there who are also talking this nonsense of, well, we got this, you know, majority now, we don't need them. Come on, Roland, I'm not convinced that Cinema or, or, or Manchin aren't going to switch to Republican just to keep the attention on, their, uh, on themselves. I agree. So we can't take anything for granted as it relates right now. If you are going to ignore yep. the black youth vote, you do that at your own expense and at our own expense. So get rid of these consultants, get some other folks out there, the Cornell Belchers of the world, people who can tell you what you need to do, because you got to start with us, because it will start with us and it will end with us. Uh, indeed, folks. Going to go to a break. We come back. Uh, you, I'm going to show you somebody who went from being arrested at the state capitol to now being sworn in at the state capitol. We'll talk to a young brother out of Tennessee uh, who has been elected to the Tennessee State House who was on the front lines protesting and fighting for African Americans. That is next on Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on this special birthday edition of yours truly on the Black Side Network. Back in a moment. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, two facts that you need to be aware of. African American women have the highest diagnosis of breast cancer than any other group in the U.S. And young African American women are most likely to be diagnosed with one of the highest aggressive forms of breast cancer than all other groups. It is a disease that requires fast action, determination, and a whole lot of support. On our next show, we'll meet a young woman who's chosen an alternative path and approach to tackling this disease. And you'll hear from our medical and support experts on how to maintain balance through it all. We encourage exercise. We encourage, you know, changing diet and making, you know, all those personal changes. That's on a next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. You know what's on the ballot. It's not just legislation and policies we believe in. It's democracy. Our democracy. There's a choice on the ballot between freedom and fear, between cruelty and compassion, between chaos and community, between voting or violence, and the end of rights generations have fought for. The extremists have a plan, a roadmap for a nation where your voice is silenced and your vote is a memory, where they count their votes and cast ours aside. That's why this year, this fight, this vote is so important. Register, engage, volunteer, fight back against the disinformation and despair, and most of all, vote, because your vote is all that stands between our future and theirs. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, Roland, it's your girl, Dr. Avis. And listen, I'm down here in North Carolina visiting my peeps, but I could not let that stop me from wishing you a very, very happy birthday and many more. Happy birthday. Enjoy your day. Bye. All right, folks, on Tuesday, Tennessee elected its youngest state representative ever. 26-year-old Justin Jones 
uh, sworn in as the newest lawmaker in Tennessee, but he is not unfamiliar with the Tennessee State Capitol. Uh, he has been arrested numerous times uh, of protesting and fighting on behalf uh, of African Americans. Uh, he ran a grassroots campaign for Tennessee's 52nd uh, district, uh, beating uh, nonpartisan candidate Delicia Porterfield uh, in the primary. Uh, and again, he has been on the front lines. He has a BA in political science uh, from Fisk University, He's completing his Master's of Theological Studies at Vanderbilt University, and his plans to focus on the climate crisis and creating equity for people of color. Folks, welcome to the show, Tennessee State Representative elect Justin Jones. Justin, glad to have you here. Uh, it must be surreal uh, as somebody who has been uh, led, led, led away in handcuffs uh, protesting to now all of a sudden uh, you get to be on the other side now deciding public policy. Yes, well, happy birthday to you, Brother Roland, um, and it's an honor to be back on your show. I believe the last time I was on was when I was the Speaker of the House was trying to frame me. I don't know if you remember that story um, from 2019, and so it's good to yep, be on the I remember. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's been a full circle, and it's it's good. I'm here in the in the People's Office of District 52, and um, we're getting to work, hitting the ground running, um, because, you know, we've been trying to get in the door, and now we have a seat at the table. This is, you know, I, I often talk, when I talk to young folks around the country, uh, I tell them that um, it's, it's very easy to protest, but then I say, you must be nuts if you say, I'm protesting, but I'm not voting. The two go hand in hand. And here you are, someone who understood that, you know what, I could yell, holler, and scream for the policymakers to start changing the policy, or I can become one of the policymakers. Mm, definitely. I think one thing I think that comes to mind is that young people turned out this election and really saved this nation. If we look at youth voter turnout, but what, what, what we're trying to represent here in Tennessee is I come from a city in Nashville where young people changed the world before. It was young people like John Lewis and Diane Nash who led the sit-ins and freedom rights from here, right here in Nashville, and it's our time again. And so, you know, I was one of the people who got tired of begging this white supremacist government to change, begging them to hear our voices. I'm getting locked out. Get arrested over 14 times in 2020. And so, you know, rather than begging the change, we said it's time to change who's in those seats. And so not only, only am I the youngest currently serving lawmaker, but I'm also the first black lawmaker in my district, um, House District 52. And so we are representing a new generation of change um, in the birthplace of the Klan here in Tennessee. I was watching your commercial that just came on, and, and this is um, ground zero of white supremacy. And those, those policies are still continuing to impact us today. I think it's no coincidence that in Tennessee you can use a gun permit to vote, but you can't use a student ID card to vote, um, because they are afraid of young people turning out, and I think that I hope my election is opening the door for other young people to run and to, to claim our power now in our state. Um, this is it is certainly uh, just awesome to see uh, what you did, and, and, and did you employ the same tactics, if you will, uh, of basic mobilizing and organizing uh, to win? Yes. I mean, our campaign, we ran a people power campaign. So it was knocking doors. Our, our, dona our donors were grandmothers and students. And, you know, I was having my first endorsement came from Sunrise Movement, who are young people who are trying to call attention to the climate crisis. Um, we, we had a, a, a coalition, a multiracial coalition. Uh, my district's the most diverse in Tennessee, and it was young people who turned out and seniors. Um, but it really took a ground game because we didn't have the money. I didn't accept any corporate PAC money. Um, the lobbyists who may go to other lawmakers, I know they weren't coming to me. And so we, you know, we used the resources we had. And I learned, you know, took what I learned in organizing when I was at Fisk University um, that, you know, we can um, talk to people and, and, and talk to them about what they hope for our state to be and give them a vision um, that we need bold change and that we don't have to wait for this type of politics of gradualism to give us permission. But when we look at the crisis of our health care system in Tennessee, when we look at police brutality, we look at th that we are the state with the lowest number, I mean, the highest number of low wage workers. Uh, we have work to do and people are ready for a radical shift in our state. Questions from my panel uh, for Justin. Uh, I'll start uh, with, uh, well, a lawmaker uh, from Georgia uh, who might have some uh, advice accounts for you. Uh, Renita, your question for Justin. Yep. Well, first, let me say happy birthday, Roland, because I forgot to tell you that directly, although I told you that on Twitter earlier today. So happy birthday and thank you for what you do for black media. Um, Justin, congratulations on winning your election. That's amazing. Um, I had a similar story. I was an activist working on black issues before being elected as well. And so mm -hmm. going from active from protest to politics, 
Um, I know that there are a bunch of issues that you care about because we live very intersectional lives as black people. So my question for you is, what is the very first issue that you are going to focus on? Yeah, the first issue that, um, thank you for that question and, and, and for your example. Uh, the first issue I'm going to focus on is the first issue that brought me into this building, the state capitol, when I was a student at Fisk, organizing with students at TSU and American Baptist, um, was fighting for, for student voting rights. In Tennessee, we, they changed the law in 2012 that we can no longer use our student ID cards to vote. Um, which we know has a disproportionate impact on young people, um, you know, who live in dormitories, who, who don't have water and utility bills, so it's hard for them to get the right identification to vote. And so I know that's going to be the first bill that I introduce is the bill that brought me into this building. Let us use our student ID cards to vote. Um, it's ridiculous that in Tennessee, if you go to TSU, you can use a staff and faculty ID card to vote, but you cannot use a student ID card, which is made from the very same machine because of how the law is crafted. And so we tried through the courts, but we know that, you know, we, there's a, we, need, we have a legislative remedy, and so that's going to be the first issue. Uh, particularly at this time, I fear that with all the young people turning out to vote, with the, the mass numbers across the nation, I feel like they're going to come after the youth vote, trying to restrict us even further um, across this nation because they're afraid of our power and afraid of what they saw uh, last week. All right. Uh, Julian. Justin, first of all, congratulations to you. I'm so excited about your leadership. You know, you stand in the footsteps of folks like Marion Barry, who attended Fisk University, got a master's there, Lemoyne Owen College, uh, his undergrad, and so many other activists. Uh, Roland called the role of so many of them, but I know they're probably smiling when they think about you. Now, when I start think about uh, the task you have ahead of you, and it, it is a daunting task, how do you intend to keep the young voters engaged? Uh, I always tell people voting is not the most you can do, it's the least you can do. So in the two years of your term, how do you intend to keep your base involved in the work that you're doing? Mm. Thank you so much for, for your question and for, you know, lifting up the elders who paved the way here, and particularly in this space where I am in, in Tennessee. Um, I think the biggest thing that, that I'm going to do and that I've been doing is we're trying to open the doors of the people's house. We're trying to demystify the process. Um, my job is to be, you know, I, I come to be a representative of the people, to help be a, a liaison, to let people know that, you know, these are the bills that are coming up. This is how the system is working. You know, this is who's organizing on Capitol Hill and how can we be as effectively organized as our opposition. And so I really hope that, you know, we, we're looking at a Young People's Day on the Hill, looking at bringing young people from across the state to the state capitol to talk about the issues that impact young people with the climate, with, uh, you know, looking at forgiving student debt, looking at, um, you know, all the issues that impact us with this critical race theory ban that's happening from K through 12 to college in Tennessee, all these ridiculous bills that are impacting young people, and young people have no voice in our state government. And so I think it's a shame that I'm the only person in state government in my 20s. I think it's, it's shameful because I believe that, you know, we cannot have a state that does not reflect the diversity of, of race, but also of age and of experience that, that we need. We have people talking about um, college tuition who haven't been in college in the past four decades. And so we need people who, who re and understand the urgency of what we're facing and if we're going to inherit the atrocities that they're passing with these bills that are making our state um, a, a difficult place for everyday Tennesseans to live in. And so we need uh, voices who will say, let's look at the long-term implications of this. And so I hope to bring more young people, particularly our HBCU students, so many have reached out saying, you know, we are inspired, we want to run next election. And so let's see how can we start organizing and recruiting people to run so we can change the state. Because I, I ask um, those on this panel and those across this nation to not discount Tennessee, because what's happening in Tennessee is the tip of the spear, what happens in the nation. Um, for the first time in Nashville, we lost our congressional voice because they gerrymandered Nashville into three congressional districts. So now our congressmen live 30 miles away in Nashville, um, a city with a large, significant black population has no representation. And so I hope that, you know, people pay attention to Tennessee and, and, and support us because of all the HBCUs, the history here, but also the present here of what we're fighting and continue to stand against um, in terms of white supremacy's extremist um, policy agenda. Uh, Omakongo. Definitely congratulations, Representative Jones. This is really a phenomenal thing that you've accomplished. And one of the things I want to know is, you talked about how environmental justice and issues related to climate change are a big part of your platform, but we all know that many people say, well, black folks don't really care about that. Can you just speak to how mistaken people are on this issue yeah. as it relates to our interest in it based on your experience and your campaign? Definitely. Um, just this past session, you had the city of Memphis, black organizers, um, you know, organizing to stop a pipeline in their community that would, that would, you know, disturb the aquifer, which is the source of drinking water. And you had this black city, you know, make clear their, their interest. And then you had the state government, you know, predominantly white body trying to supersede that interest, trying to supersede 
that voice of the people. And so we know that environmental justice is is critical um, in in Tennessee, where we've had flooding, increased flooding, we've had increased you know tornadoes. This this climate catastrophe is already here. Um, and also, you know, looking at it in terms of agriculture, where Tennessee, you know, so many of our black farmers have been pushed out and have not been given the fair chance. You know, um, the, the black farmers in Tennessee sued the federal government because of um, inequality when it came to grants and loans. And so, you know, we know that um, climate justice and environmental justice is a critical issue for our community. We look at public transportation and how my district, which is a working class district where people have to commute and we have no accessible public transportation, which is not only good for the environment, but which is good for public, um, which is good for the, um, the public as, as a whole, particularly working class people. And so when I look at the climate crisis, when I look at what's happening in our state, we know young people are leading the fight across the nation, including here in Tennessee. I'm really honored to be a part of this movement because that's really what galvanized me as one of the key issues to run because we're running out of time to address the climate crisis. Um, and as black people, we know who's going to be expendable. It's going to be black, brown, and poor people who are going to be treated as disposable when we, you know, when we have these flooding and we have this massive heat and, and lack of, you know, electricity. So we, we have to look at this now and be proactive about it. And a lot of these people here um, in my state, you know, don't even take it seriously. They don't take this as an issue. Um, because they don't care about the long-term implications. They, they, they are comfortable with where they are. They, they want to go back to the good old days. Um, and that's the kind of Im imagery that we see um, of the Southern aristocracy that we're fighting. And so um, I hope that we see that both racial and economic justice and environmental justice are parallel issues that have to be addressed simultaneously. All right, Justin Jones, look, man, congratulations. I look forward to see you doing your thing and certainly hope that you inspire uh, other young folks to get involved in the political process uh, and to understand that protest is vitally important, but you got to change the policy makers, the politicians, in order to see the policies change. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Thank you so much. Folks, got to go to a quick break. We come back. Lots of drama happening out of Haiti, folks. Uh, sad, sad uh, conditions there. Jacqueline Charles, reporter with the Miami Herald, will join us to tell us exactly what's going on uh, and why the United States is in a bind when it comes to trying to help solve the problem. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, less than 5% of the top executive positions in corporate America are held by women of color. We know it's not because of talent. A recent study says that it's microaggressions, unconscious bias, and limited opportunities being offered to women of color. On our next show, we're gonna get incredible advice from Francine Parham, who's recently written a book sharing exactly what you need to do to make it up into the management ranks and get the earnings that you deserve. I made a point to sit down and I made a point to talk to people. And I made a point to be very purposeful and thought provoking when I spoke to them. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. It's Kim Whitley. Yo, what's up? This your boy Ice Cube. Hey, yo, Peace World. What's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon. And you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. <laughs> Since the assassination of Haiti's president, the country has been plunged into despair. Lots of fighting, kidnappings, violence. What in the world is happening there? And can the United States be a trusted partner to assist in stabilizing the country? Jacqueline Charles, an award-winning journalist, former journalist of the year for the National Association of Black Journalists with Miami Herald. She joins us right now. Jacqueline, always glad to have you. Uh, this story, I've been seeing um, just what, what's been going on and just... just where do we stand now that investigation of, of the president uh, is it is it going anywhere and and, and my goodness um, you know what in the world can be done because the it's, the violence uh, has just gotten out of hand so let's talk about the investigation of the president I actually have a project that I've been working on it's going to be coming out in a couple of days so feel free to tune into the miamiherald.com. Um, where I basically get you caught up on um, on this investigation and reveal some new information that had not been put out there. But the reality is, is that there are currently three 
people that have been charged in the United States after they fled to the Dominican Republic and Jamaica, respectively. And so the U.S. has a parallel investigation. They are now scheduled to go to trial in March. All three of these individuals, one Colombian, two Haitian nationals, including a former senator um, that are implicated in the assassination, they were all pled not guilty. Um, the United States itself has filed paperwork to basically keep some information um, top secret for lack of a better word. So are we ever going to really know who killed the president and why that remains to be seen? There's a lot of information that probably will not surface to the public. Um, me and my colleagues who've been working on this from day one, we hope otherwise, and we hope to bring some of those troops. In Haiti, there are about 42 people that are currently jailed in Haiti. They have not even officially been charged. The case is now on its fifth investigative judge. For one reason or another, judges don't want to take this case. Um, and there's been a question in terms of the political will, in terms of the Haitians, to even investigate this. Um, so that's where we are with the assassination of the president. As you know, President Biden earlier this year signed the omnibus bill. Um, it's a spending bill, but in there, there was some language about Haiti. And one of the language basically called for the State Department to provide a report to Congress on the assassination investigation where we are. Well, it was three pages, and it really didn't say anything. In fact, it just says there's a lot that we can't tell you because this is an ongoing investigation. Now to the country itself. So since so September, you... Haiti right. was essentially under gang control. Um, you had a gang that um, took over the country's main fuel terminal. Um, everything just ground to a halt. Schools could not start. You're talking about millions of children unable to go to school. There was no drinking water because you need fuel in order to treat water. As a result, we've seen a resurgence of cholera, a deadly waterborne disease that had not been confirmed in Haiti in over three and a half years. They thought that they were on their way to basically getting rid of cholera. And now we have thousands of cases of cholera. That's what we know of, because the reality is, is that people still cannot move because of the gangs, because of the kidnapping. Um, a week ago, the primary gang leader, whose name is Jimmy Sharizia, but better known as Barbecue, he basically said, OK, the fuel terminal is open, and you need to bring in the trucks, so and you need to get the fuel. Um, you know, over the weekend, they started putting in fuel. Uh, we're going to see what happens there. But, you know, the reality is, is just because, you know, this powerful gang coalition called the G9 is no longer holding the main fuel terminal hostage doesn't mean that the problems haven't gone away. I've got a list of people who have been kidnapped the last couple of days. We have journalists who have been shot, almost killed. Some have been killed. We've got a prominent political leader, former presidential candidate. He was shot even and killed, even though he was in an armored vehicle. They had his, um, um, his case today, I'm sorry, his, his funeral. Um, and today I just got, you know, confirmation from a State Department spokesperson that U.S. embassy vehicles were part of a convoy that included Haitian National Police vehicles, as well as Haitian commercial drivers, that they were attacked by a gang. Um, there was one person that was injured that was a Haitian commercial driver. But things are happening in this country that we just have never seen before. And the average Haitian are, is just basically being held hostage, because whether you go out of your house or you stay in your home, people are living in fear that they don't know if somebody is, or a gang leader is going to come to their door and take them out, or either by killing them or either by grabbing them to, you know, to hold them for ransom. So what, the, the military in Haiti is just simply utterly irrelevant, that they can't actually there's no military. Uh, stop uh, so there's no military. <laughs> So there's no, so there's no military now. So the, so, the so, U.S. The U.S. Yeah. And so now let's talk about the U.S. because um, there are folks who are saying, well, do does the United States go in? Then others say that the United States has no credibility uh, in this, and so Biden is sort of in a in a in a difficult position. So from your reporting. What do folks want from the United States? Do they believe the United States can serve a peacekeeping role? Or do we go back to the fear of here, the U.S. again, trying to take over this black country? 
Okay, so there's still military because the United States, after one too many coups, basically under pressure from the United States, Haiti had to get rid of its military. Back in 1915, during the U.S. occupation, um, the U.S. created the Gendarmerie, which basically became the armed forces of Haiti. Um, today, what you have is the Haitian National Police Force, 12,000 individuals for 12 million people. Um, the U.S. is a huge provider of the funding for that force, as well as Canada. So the United States is already implicated. They have rebuilt this force about twice in the last um, 30 years. Uh, the force continues to struggle. I've got top officials in the Haitian National Police who cannot sleep in their own homes. They're sleeping in police stations because either where they live is surrounded by gangs or the road to get to and from work is basically overtaken by gangs. That's the reality that we are in. Um, the, the interim Haitian prime minister has asked for armed forces and outside force to come in and to help that country because what you're looking at is the worst security, economic, and humanitarian crisis. 4.7 million people do not know where their next meal is coming from. An additional 200,000 children since March, a cholera outbreak. I mean, you name it, this country is, is, is experiencing it. So the question is, is that what is the solution? How do you how do you deal with it? And that is what you're you're seeing that the U.S. and others are wrestling with. The United States has a resolution before the United Nations Security Council, but the U.S. does not want to lead this force. And what's happening in the international arena is saying, well, wait a minute, the U.S., you've always told us you are the biggest, you know, um, aid provider to Haiti. Haiti is Haiti is your, in your backyard, your front yard, but, you know, you, you don't allow us to go in. But now it's messy, and you want us to go in, and you don't want to take the lead. That's where Biden finds himself. He has the reputation of being the non-interventionist. And here's a country that is asking to intervene or wants intervention, depending on who you talk to, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It, and the U.S. basically is finding itself to say, okay, so are there any takers in this region that they can lead a multinational force into Haiti? And what they're finding is that they're not really getting any takers. The idea would be that Haiti has to go back under what you call Chapter 7, which is basically supervision of the United Nations Security Council. China and Russia are fighting that. They're saying, well, it's going to cost. But the reality is this, is that increasingly, every day that this crisis goes on, Haiti increasingly becomes a threat to its neighbor. You've got illegal arms that are going in there, despite the fact there's a U.S. arms embargo. You've got people fleeing by boat, by foot. Um, you know, so at some point, whether the world likes it or not, it may call for an intervention. Now, this whole question of intervening by the U.S. or outside forces, it's a very delicate and touchy issue. You say to Haiti, Haitians, well, are you okay with, you know, a, a foreign intervention or an occupation? They tell you, you tell you no. But if you say, do you think the, the Haitian police needs assistance? Do you give, do you trust your Haitian police to provide you security? They tell you they don't trust the police to do it, the police can't do it, and that the police need help. So it's a very nuanced thing, and that's where we are today. I mean, but when you talk to the average Haitian, I'm not talking about the people that have access to you or I, but the people that are on the street that cannot get out, cannot send their kids to school. They live constant fear about gangs. Women are being raped. The gangs are using rape as a tool, sexual violence. What they're telling you is they just they want to breathe, they want to break, and that they just need help. That is what people are calling. People are calling me and saying, hey, when is the blonde? When is the foreigner coming? You know, they're just wondering, when are they going to be able to breathe again? That is just, um, uh, it is unfortunate, uh, sad, uh, and shocking as well. Uh, we look forward to your report, Jacqueline, uh, and regarding the assassination investigation uh, and, and just... Look, we can say hope, we can say thoughts and prayers. No, uh, Haiti needs intervention. It needs action. And frankly, the United States must should be stepping up uh, when it comes to help uh, our neighbor to the south. Thank you. Happy birthday. We appreciate it. Ah, thanks a bunch. Appreciate it. Uh, real quick, each of our panel, um, some final comments before I, I go. We got our comment, my conversation with Malcolm Nance after this. Uh, Juliana, I'll start with you. Uh, as I said, United States, look, step up, lead when it comes to Haiti. Uh, that is a humanitarian crisis that is, that is happening there. We still are deporting people back to that country. Uh, we're deporting folks back to, uh, you know, hell on earth. We should be doing more. We absolutely should be doing more. Um, 
I'm, I'm almost speechless. I have relatives there. Uh, my maternal grandfather is Haitian. I last visited Haiti in 2010 when, um, after the earthquake, and saw the devastation there, more than 3 million people. I don't think Haiti ever recovered from the earthquake. Uh, but the U.S. must intervene. But even more than that, we, um, in the United States, Rolla, we had a conversation, great conversation at Howard uh, Thursday night last. And one of the issues, uh, Ron Daniels, brought, we don't talk about international stuff enough in the black community. We need to know more about this. These are our cousins. These are our people. We came over on the same ships. Uh, some people got off early. Um, but so in any case, the United States has an interest in this. And you're right, Biden has a non-interventionist uh, reputation. So I would call on the Congressional Black Caucus to look at this and to look at what the United States can do. Uh, after 2010, millions of dollars were collected. Uh, I don't know that they all got where they were supposed to go. And we need to look at things like that as well. Um, Congo? It was, it's, it's really sad. I mean, dealing, seeing what Haiti has been dealing with on different levels for, for decades, really. And I think at the end of the day, when we talk about Biden and his policies, he can talk about, oh, not really an interventionist type of guy or whatever, but there are basic things that we can look at. So, for example, the United States can help with stopping the proliferation of weapons. It should be very easy to find out where these weapons are coming from that are being placed on the ground to be able to kill so many people and be used to, to, do, to do what's happening there. That's something that's very simple. When we saw what happened with the Rwandan genocide, we saw that the United States had a, the very basic uh, capabilities to be able to shut down the radio signals that were going out to encourage more killing in, in the genocide there, and Clinton didn't do that. So there are many situations across, this, across the globe where when it comes to the black nations, there are very minimal things that the United States can do to help with the people who are on the ground there, but they choose not to do it, which is problematic because uh, on the flip side of that, they've had a reputation of, of extortion or negative intervention as it relates to what's happening on the people, let's say, with Lumumba in Congo, for example, for Duvalier, you know, for decades as well. So at what point is the United States going to realize that it needs to start stepping up and being a public force for good for some of these black nations that it has served as part of the problem and why they suffer the way they do today. All right, then. Uh, 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 final comment, um, Rita. Well, I'm not going to repeat what the other two panelists said, but I agree with what they're saying. The other thing I would add is that you know, Biden cannot just say that he's an inter he he does not intervene because we've seen the support that has gone to Ukraine. I mean, the United States figured out a way to not have boots on the ground, but to figure out ways to be able to support the Ukrainians um, in a way that is absolutely intervening. And we continue to hear conversations about more and more support, whether it be in the ways of money and just other things that uh, will be done for the Ukrainians. So I think, given the history of the United States and what they've done to negatively intervene um, in Haiti, I do think the United States owes it to Haiti to assist in the ways that uh, will be supportive and not exploited. All right, then. Uh, to my panel, to my panel, I appreciate it. Renita, Makongo, and Julian, I surely appreciate y'all joining us. Thank you so very much. Folks, got to go to break. We come back. Malcolm Nance talks about his new book, lays out uh, where Republicans are when it comes to aligning with Putin and what the future holds when it comes to right-wing extremism in the United States and all across the world. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Folks, I'm about to run off to go to this dinner uh, for Chris Tucker being put on by the uh, president of Prairie View, uh, Ruth Simmons. And so I look forward to our Malcolm conversation. Uh, and of course, I'll see you guys back in studio tomorrow in D.C. right here at Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't go anywhere. Y'all do not want to miss my conversation with Malcolm Nance. Malcolm Nance, he lays it down, folks. And you definitely want to hear what he has to say. Back in a moment. It's about us. Let's go! Everybody out together. We are in sunny South Dallas. The election is coming up. It's super important that folks know who they are voting for, but more importantly, what they are voting for. Y'all, we got the free shirts and free lunch right over here. Freedom is our birthright. No matter what we're up against, we're sending a message in Dallas and Texas and in this country. We won't black down. That's what this bus tour is all about. The housing cost is one of the most capitalized areas that we have found. People who are marginalized that are brown and black, we are suffering the most. And I think that we have the biggest vote and the biggest impact in this election. I'm voting for affordable housing, for sure. We should not be 
paying the cost of a utility failure because our elected officials are too proud to say, we need help. I know that we can bring out our people to vote. It's a part of our birthrights, right. it's a part of our heritage, and surely it's a part of our prison, a part of our future. That's right, that's what's up. And we won't black down. Forward that message to five friends, because in that message, it's got links to how to get registered, how to check your registration status. Like I said, 2.30, we'll start um, rendezvousing right here on this street. I am voting to let our voice be heard in the rural communities that, hey, we are people too. There are things that we need. Free shirts, free food, and lots of power. We are in Longview, Texas, where black voters matter, 365. Whatever type of oppression a white supremacist throws our way, we will not black down. We are in relentless pursuit of liberation of our people. Freedom is liberation for black bodies and black communities to make economic change through political power. Freedom is choice. We won't black down. 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 Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. 54. Looks good on you, Roland. Happy birthday, brother. Thank Baba Reggie Sr. And thank Mama Imelda Joyce for having you and the whole family. And I hope that you're having a beautiful day, brother. Didn't even put on a dashiki and no African clothes. Put on the black and old gold because uh, NRD, AFIA, fraternal spirit binds all the noble, the true, and courageous manly deeds, scholarship, and love for all mankind are the aims of our dear fraternity. They don't know nothing about that. The oldest and the coldest, but not only on behalf of all the alphas and all the black folk in the world, but all of us who benefit from fearless black own black supported journalism, brother. I want to thank you. Who knew that a Twitter beef would bring such a beautiful friendship? Love you very much, brother. Still tipping on five fours, wrapped in four bows for little Houston in it. Love you, brother. Happy birthday. <laughs> All right, Malcolm, let's get right into it. Uh, I, I, I have this hashtag, hashtag we tried to tell you. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I, I use that uh, a lot with Trump and, and, and all these crazy folks. And, and black people, I, I keep saying, America, white America, if y'all listen to black people, we would could have avoided the January 6th hearing. We could have avoided all this sort of stuff. And we could be real honest about what's happening with these extremists, these extremists, these white nationalists, these white supremacists, because we know what that feels like. We've been saying this stuff, and now all of a sudden, people, rest of the people kind of like, oh my goodness, these Oath Keepers, rest of the people, oh, that thing is for real? Yeah, it's real. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, um, my publisher, or no, my literary agent has a professor of, uh, who, of black sociology. And she actually came up with a theory where she said um, the, uh, the opinions of African Americans are routinely ignored until they've been validated by a white American, no matter how low level. And uh, we're, we're seeing that. As you know, when I, I when on November 6, 2020, I went on real time with Bill Maher and said, this is what was going to happen. I predicted the United States was entering a phase of insurgency. And an insurgency is an ins a series of insurrections and a political uprising against the established government uh, used to destabilize that government and generally to install a dictator. And poor Bill Maher, you know, he was looking at me like, wait a minute, I just said we're going to do kumbaya. We're not, there was no kumbaya plan. I right. Was of that happening. Dude, they were this plotting to overthrow the government while the election was happening. 
Dude, and it, it is, it is, I mean, what is aggravating, and look, look, my book, White Fear, drops uh, in uh, in September, September 13th. Mm-hmm. And and since 2009, I'll never forget, it was a study, and the studies, it, it, the survey said, are you optimistic about the future of America for your children? Right. Every group, Blacks, Latinos, Asian, Native Americans, everybody, more than majority was optimistic. That was one group that was less than the majority, white mm-hmm. America. And I went, whoa, September 2016, another survey. Are you optimistic about the future of America economically for the next 10 years? Black mm-hmm. people, lowest wealth, highest optimism. Latinos, young and white, white America, highest wealth, lowest optimism. And I'm going, hey, y'all, there's something here. And the reality is mm-hmm. these folks... Do not like the browning of America, and this is about power. This is about money, Malcolm. Yeah, of course. And they view the word, I mean, you see some of these legislative moves, like in Florida and in in other states, where the word diversity is struck from the word diversity, which is literally, you know, despite what, you know, that the founding fathers were all black landowners. They, they, they looked forward to having all of the diverse uh, beliefs and, <laughs> and, and experiences brought to America by the immigrants that they were. Alexander Hamilton and, you know, uh, all the others who, who came to the United States were, were, were looking forward to having people come in and bring money and cash and resources to make America more diverse. But now it is an anathema to them. They hate the word because it means... It's not diversity. They know it means equal opportunity. And well, equal wait, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Remember, Dr. Oz sent out a Juneteenth tweet, and they went so nuts, he removed the word equality Yikes. from the subsequent tweet. That's insane. That to be part of their cult, to be part of their tribal existence. And that's what we're dealing with. And that's what my book outlines quite a bit of, is that we're dealing with a tribe now. And Donald Trump is the tribal chief. You know, of, of, <laughs> it's really funny. Where did all this come from? Why have all these people re- self-radicalized like ISIS and Al-Qaeda? I blame two things. One, the movie 300, which showed, you know, you know 300 guys, 900 six-pack abs. Right. And this image of masculinity being murderous and toxic from childhood. And then the other one is the TV show Vikings. I've literally seen so many Viking runic tattoos now. It has exploded. And they believe that they are marauding, you know, tribal chiefs going from place to place, taking as they want. They view anyone else as being an outsider who is who is stealing from their birthright. And to them, to these extremists, to the they in the title of my book, they want to kill Americans. We're talking about people who believe the United States belongs to no one other than the lower middle white to upper middle middle white, uh, upper middle class white male tribe. And they don't care that Donald Trump is a pathological liar. He's their chieftain. He is the person who is their icon. And they will accept anything that he does, rape, murder, whatever, um, so long as he meets their tribal goals. There's a scene. Uh, did, you, did, you see, did you ever see the movie The, um, uh, the, uh, the Under Shepherd? I'm sorry. Is that the correct title? Uh, I can't believe I'm I'm, I'm missing it. Um, um, it was uh, Matt Damon, uh, Robert De Niro, The Good Shepherd. I'm sorry, The Good, good Shepherd. Shepherd. It's The Good Shepherd. And I and I, I I play this scene all the time. And that scene with Joe Pecci and Matt Damon. Mm-hmm. And Joe Pecci says, "Let me ask you something." He said, "The, the, 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 the he said the Italians. We got the church." He said. Uh, he, he goes to the Irish, he goes to the Jews. He, for black people, he calls us the N-word, said they got their music. And he says, what do you people have? And Matt Damon says, we've got the United States of America. The rest mm-hmm. of you are just visiting. Oh, absolutely. And that, that 
scene right there in in short lays out it, it is your book their whole deal is this is ours right and this is why i say stop thinking of this as socioeconomic and start thinking of it as tribal right and it is really these guys now view themselves as a marauding band of viking horde who now believe that anyone that comes into the uh, that brings anything that threatens their worldview of what the United States is must be taken down by force. You know, I mean, I, I spent three decades protecting this country against the worst of tribal warlords overseas, third world potentates, you know, making sure American citizens weren't killed. And what I have now, I have my entire nation, 30% have decided the American experiment is no good. It's not worth it. They want to go back to the pre-Constitution America where the, that these things were settled in the villages and that the federalist system should only apply to them in their benefit. And everyone else should be used to be prosecuted by that system. And that's why they find it rolling. They get upset when they're arrested. For yeah. breaking laws. I mean, Peter Navarro, how, how dare they, how dare they put me in? Uh, uh, they put, they, they arrested me and they had me in, in handcuffs. Because y'all ain't, that's what happens when you get arrested. God almighty. You know, bitch, you a criminal. <laughs> you know, there is no difference. I and mean, then we really needed to, a cop to have stood up and say, I'm sorry, everyone that gets put into this vehicle gets handcuffed. Drug dealer, right? White collar crime or seditionist. And they find, oh my God, they go on Fox News and they literally cry. Uh, the standard prison that they wanted Antifa and Black Lives Matter thrown into jail in Washington, D.C. suddenly becomes, you know, a, a white South African Boer concentration camp where everyone's dying of smallpox when a white person is put into it, that's of their political faith. The system does not exist to punish them. It exists to reward them. Now, as an intelligence analyst, somebody who has studied ISIS, Al-Qaeda, all these other terrorist groups throughout my entire career, this is where the destabilization of government is necessary. Because what we've done is we've now called out their world. And their world requires them to, um, to re-engineer re that world. And now they're ready to re-engineer it by force. And they yeah. are using the term civil war. You know, I wrote this book a year and a half. We started it a year and a half ago. Wow. Before the election. And when I wow. went on Bill Maher and I was telling him, hey, we're going to civil, you know, to insurgency, which is a campaign of destabilization. You know, um, I wasn't joking. And then 62 days later, the kickoff occurs because I was seeing all the signs that this was happening. You know, I'm going to tell, tell you an indicator real quick, Roland. The price of AR-15 ammunition in George Floyd summer went from 39 cents a round to $1.25. Boom. That's called supply and demand. Right up to the election. What does that tell you? As an intelligence analyst, if that was Libya... OK, and I started seeing this spike in ammunition. I would be putting out a little report saying they are preparing to mass murder each other in civil war. Well, see, it's see, happening here. Here's the thing that um, uh, it, it's so interesting you say that, because when I talked about that, that uh, that poll that was taken in 2009, mm -hmm. John Avon and I, we were at CNN, we were waiting to go on the air. We were talking about because his book was dealing with wing nuts and stuff along those lines. Right. And I said, John, I said, let's be clear. We are seeing the beginning stages. And it really wasn't the beginning because we've never, it actually never has ended. I said, but John, we are in the midst. We are seeing the beginning of what I call white minority resistance. Mm. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I said, oh, let's be clear. White people are still the majority. I said, but they are, they are about to be begin to operate as if they are the minority, mm -hmm. as if they are the victims, as if they are the aggrieved. Then you had Glenn Beck going on television and calling Obama a racist. He hates white people. 
and then and then then you begin to see the white nationalist um, uh, sentiments on Fox News and conservative talk radio, and then it's like, oh my God, white men are so aggrieved, and all of a sudden now you have these polls where white people feel as if, uh, especially white Republicans, that there is more discrimination against them than anybody else, uh, and it's because they, I said point blank, I said because they don't want to share, they don't. Want, I said, and I said, now let's go back in history. I said that was the whole point of view after the civil rights movement. Oh my God, they're going to take our jobs. They're going to take our money. They're going to, they're going to move into our neighborhoods. How dare? Uh, uh, now, did, you can take this thing back to, uh, again, uh, uh, after after the Civil War, uh, doing uh, Reconstruction. At the end of the day, this is what I said, that black success has always been followed by white backlash. Mm -hmm. And I've been telling people, you had better prepare yourselves because this is not going to end with Trump. This is about to be the next 50 to 100 years. You're absolutely because they cannot handle America 2.0. They cannot handle the fact that you now have a voice. I have a voice that I own a company that we have resources. And this is what and people go, oh, you can't, you can't say that's all whites. But the thing is, it is a significant number. And you have the scale. You, you write about those who are radicalized at the top. But then it's all those who have the same sentiments, they simply don't say it publicly. Right. Absolutely. And what you're seeing now, Donald Trump gave that tribe permission to say yes. publicly, right? To be a racist, to be a bore, to be a, a misogynist, to be an adulterer, right? To be a, essentially a rapist in some instances, a sexual assaulter, nudge and a wink and a nod where his wife you know, uh, you know, uh, says that this is just locker room talk. You know, I just came from Ukraine uh, where I was fighting on the side of justice and goodness. And there was an audio recording of a guy speaking to his girlfriend, a Russian, who the girlfriend is saying, you can rape Ukrainian women so long as you wear a condom. I mean, it's insane. We have that here. Donald Trump, you know, a sexually assaults women. They don't care. Eric Greitens former Navy SEAL, former governor of Missouri, is impeached, kicked out of office because he sexually assault, rapes a woman that he's with, who he's at a relation, he's having an affair with, right? Blackmails her with nude photos of it so that his wife wouldn't find out about it. And now he's running as the lead Republican candidate for senator. This is a, we have destabilized to the point yes. where their tribe no longer cares about criminality if it's white criminality. There's no norms. There, there are no more norms. Uh, and again, what used to be, can't say that, can be put. Now, you, you're right. Donald Trump, a lot of them say, yo, we're now unleashed. We're good. And here's the thing that's interesting. I felt the moment Donald Trump uh, trashed John McCain as a POW, oh, yeah. and they did not penalize him, that's when I said, y'all, if what look, we know how white folks feel about POWs, especially right. white prisoners of war. Right. When they said that was acceptable, I said, hell, everything is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Well, I gotta tell you, you know, for their their hero worship, this uh, you know, putting every person in the military on a pedestal unless you're on their side. Boom. Right? They they support war criminals, you know, uh people who have literally murdered people on the battlefield that Donald Trump gave pardons to, pardons to war criminals. And held them and up murdered. as heroes. Yes, and held them up as heroes. But a guy like John McCain, anyone who you disagree with politically, you destroy. Interesting, interesting fact. You, you mentioned earlier about any success by a black person. Um, uh, it, 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 I find it fascinating. I actually have an entire class of critics in the Republican side that are disgraced former felons, right? Scott Ritter, the former um, weapons inspector who was arrested and sent to prison for three years for soliciting pedophilia, right? Um, John Kiriakou, CIA officer who was kicked out, uh, not kicked out, he was sent to prison for outing a CIA officer's real name. Uh, this one guy who's on Twitter uh, who I've never met before in my career, swears he, he served with me, right? It's a three-time felon DUI. Jack Posobiec, 
as another guy kicked out of the military, right. suspected of being working with Russian intelligence and was made the urinalysis officer. Every one of them attacked me publicly in hopes that they can rise in the Republican Party by attacking a successful black man who they can't get anything on. And it drives them nuts. But they do it. These are convicted felons, pedophiles, drunks. And this is their way up. It's utterly amazing. Take down a black man. Go after a black Supreme Court justice. Go after the former black president. Go after any white that supports equality in any way, shape, or form. This will lead to guns at some point. As we say, it'll go to guns. And someone will say, you know, or someone will act and decide that they've had enough dealing with this with shooters one, two, ten at a time. And they will start doing the Mc Timothy McVeigh. When he blew up the Murrah building, it was part of the plan in his head that a race war was supposed to break out in America and that all whites in the military and police were supposed to take their weapons, turn and start mass murdering blacks. You know what? Timothy McVeigh would be held up as a hero today. And yep. an icon yep. would probably yep. get an internship. Yep. Boom. You, I mean, you, you absolutely nailed it. And, 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 and the thing, and, and the thing that, 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 that bothers me, Malcolm, is that, oh, you're an alarmist. Oh, Roland, you're racist. You're wrong. And I keep trying to warn people. This, this, well, I remember on ABC this week, I said, the Republican Party has, has allowed evil into their home, and now it will consume them. Well, we can we can go back to the Tea Party. We can have this thing escalated. And the problem that I have, Malcolm, is I don't believe, I do not believe current Democratic leaders fully comprehend and understand the lengths to which these people are going to go. President Biden kept talking about he he in his mind, he really thought the Republican Party of old was going to return when Donald Trump left. And I'm like, bruh, that's gone. These people are appealing to the ex extremists. They are appealing to the Confederates. They are right. appealing to the racists. They know that's their base and they yeah, are absolutely. not going to go back. That's, that's gone. And you know what? I have an entire chapter in this book, which my editor actually argued with me about a year ago where I talked about how the Republican Party sought to co-opt the, the strength and energy of QAnon, right? The crazy conspiracy theory in which liberals are eating children and drinking their blood in order to, you know, in order to get high or stay young, right? Which is just insane, insane, right? I mean, the QAnon people were the first people into the Capitol. We, we saw all of that. But in the last year, and I predicted this in my book, that QAnon ideology, the belief that all liberals, Jews, blacks, women, anyone that, in, that enables them, that believes in equality, that they are inherently equal and must be destroyed in a mass pogrom, right? A mass murder called the day of the storm, right? And many people, many QAnon thought January the storm when they could start mass murdering people, like Timothy McVeigh thought. And that ideology is now fundamental base Republican Party ideology. It has consumed the Republican Party. And that you used to not be able to wear QAnon clothing or markings or anything. Now, yeah, it's part of the game now. Um, it, it, it's, it's part of the game, and the, the thing that Again, I, I mean, I, I keep trying to explain to people when you begin to really break down this thing, I, I think, again, part of the issue in America is that we talk about white supremacists, white nationalists, these racists. Mm -hmm. People keep thinking, oh, flags burning in yards, clan hoods. Right. They, no. they, they excuse the tiki torches in Charlottesville. Right. But what I kept trying to explain to people is if you actually study American history, when you had the Klan out there, you had Klan people who were in elected office. 
Absolutely. You couldn't you get had, elected in office at some points with the rise of the third clan. You in had and 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 of course Republicans go, oh, it was a Democratic Party, but they forget about that group of white Republicans. It was called the Lily White Party. Lily White Party. Mm -hmm. And it was Hoover, President Hoover, who was one of their leaders, the Lily White, and the Lily White Republicans aligned with the Playing with Southern Democrats Southern because, because white was white. And mm -hmm. what we have to understand is that now you have individuals who are in public office mm -hmm. who are aligned politically with these people who are passing laws. Now you have a hardcore Supreme Court that is returning states' rights. And so now their whole deal is Republicans controlling 30 legislatures, controlling Republican governor's mansion. Their whole deal is, you know what? Yeah, we'll deal with the federal, but we're going to control more than half of American states, and they're giving us the power to do so. And also, you combine the extremists, the malicious, you can try, co combine now with those with political power. Now, all of a sudden, they literally have this entire infrastructure to then drive through their agenda, and their agenda ain't got nothing to do with me and you. And listen to this. Here's one of the scenarios that I outline in my book, because people will say, well, you know, the federal government will keep us safe and, you know, this isn't going to happen. Here's where the next insurrection is going to happen. It's going to be after the Supreme Court, of course, rules that states essentially have supremacy over, yep. the, over the federal cause. You will have an insurrection that takes over a state house with yep. armed men by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And they will just they will either beat or in some way get rid of the Democrats in the state legislature. Hmm, Malcolm, that up. sounds like the period of Reconstruction yeah. when they cut the deal of the Great Compromise of 1877 and removed the federal troops from the last three southern states. Right. But what you're going to see in, in this modern iteration of it is instead of the, the governor calling out the National Guard, the governor will support this. And the state troopers will support it. And the legislature will support it. And they will not allow or, or threaten to not allow federal authorities in their, in their state. That's going to happen. And they'll essentially declare themselves a free state of, you know, Alabama, Sonia, or whatever it is, you know, which is really sovereign citizen talk, that they are no longer part of this. This is a, a, a soft secession, all right? Because it's logical that this is going to come next, mm -hmm. that they believe that they themselves, that states' rights now eliminate because of the Supreme Court, right, or is now eliminating the, the supremacy clause in the Constitution, which is literally written in there, right? But they're going to give them a, a way around it. And then people are going to start declaring that, you know, um, that Oregon and, and, and parts of Idaho or the whole state of Idaho they don't have to listen to federal laws. The Supreme Court told them they don't have to. And I'm telling you, the Supreme Court, re, you know, reworking the Supreme Court and, you know, through the through the, the, the House of Representatives, getting uh, the, a better vehicle to impeach them and getting uh, more Supreme Court justices on there, that's imperative. But you know what? Like you said, Democrats and our Democratic leaders do not think of this as 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 dangerous because they are not radicals. They are the soft-spoken people who want to see cooperation and kumbaya until someone comes through their office and threatens to kill them, right? Mm -hmm. Republicans the same way. Steve Scalise didn't learn anything about a random gunman coming out and shooting him. He would more, uh, you know, he almost advocates for, you know, the January 6th rioters in the overthrow of the government. They want this government back, and they want it, in their version of America. And as mm -hmm. the great defense writer Thomas uh, Ricks wrote, um, he said, I can't believe that there's a, there's a segment of the white American population that no longer believe or will support America unless it's the America they want by force. You know, um, I think what is most frustrating is when we, we walk through these things, and there's some black people, really, Malcolm, dude, come on, really. I mean, y'all try to take it too far. 
But part of this, Malcolm, is because there are too many people, black people, white people, Latinos, Asian, Native Americans, mm -hmm. who are truly ignorant of American history. Yeah. They always say, you got to know where you've been and know where you are and know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And when we see these things happening, and, and, and I can tell you, I've been on new, I've been on, when I was on CNN for six years and, and making appearances on uh, ABC and his other places, you know, the, the one time I did Bill Maher's show, walking, all these people, you know, like, oh, yeah, okay, all right. Okay. And I'm going, no, y'all ain't paying attention. Mm -hmm. This is American history. What you are describing in this book, what we're talking about, has already happened. Mm -hmm. This is truly history repeating itself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, most people don't realize there were three rises of the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, it didn't happen once. It happened three times. And at one of them, the first one, federal forces put it down like the Iraq insurgency, right? They tore through villages. They rooted up governors. They rooted up legislators. They took them all out, right, and, 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 and got rid of it. Then, of course, that's when the compromises came in to allow them to take power again. Right? And then in the 1920s, the, the third rise of the Klan, it was extremely popular in the northern states. Extremely popular. So were lynchings were extremely popular. And you couldn't get a job in some places if you were not a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Our problem is we, like you say, we are history ignorant. Now, you know, I'm an intelligence professional. My job is to study an op area, operations area, and I study their history to find out where is the base of their grievance. Our problem is we don't care where the grievance is, so long as the mass Singer and Candy Crush is available, right, and that we get to listen to our music, you know, and gas isn't too high. We don't care. Right now, because of gas prices, we have Democrats. How is it Joe Biden has a 33% approval rating amongst Democrats, right? He's given them almost everything they want, except everybody wants their own little thing. And they would rather lose this country entirely than not get their, you know, their particular is issue, whether it's criminal justice reform. Well, now we're starting to see what it looks like when you lose those things in spades. But wait till we lose them and then suddenly you start losing your life by people who believe civil war is the only option. Oh, but we're not going to be ready for it. And that's why I wrote this book, so you can be ready for it. The, the, uh, on that particular point, I, I think it, it, it is crucial uh, to, to, to really break that down because, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I hear these people and uh, I, I deal with these FBA, B1, ADOS folks, uh, yeah. and, and I walk them through and I go, so I said, so I'm confused. Um, like like this one dude, he ran against Clyburn for Congress, and he was like, uh, and he was, uh, he was, he, he was going the Democrat, Democrats, and I said, but you ran as a Democrat against Clyburn, so are you talking about yourself? And then he put folks like, so you want reparations? And then I said, well, show me one Republican who supports reparations. And then I say, so how you think you're going to get it? I mean, this is real simple, and I, I totally understand. And I'm there with anybody. People, yo, tangibles. Well, first of all, okay. I can ask someone to support something, and they could say yes, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen because I then got to make sure after they get elected that they actually do what they said. But then I also got to realize that they only have one vote, and then I got to work to make sure that the other people also agree with that as well. Which means I've got to have an infrastructure in place to then ensure that what they promised me, I'm going to receive. But this notion that somehow you're just going to get it just happens. No, you. it's like I keep saying the election is the end of one process and beginning of another. And then right. you hear the people who say, well, you know, black people, we survived slavery. We, we can survive Trump. I'm going, yeah, but what you can't survive is when they codify the law. Mm -hmm. What you can't survive is when they control with six votes the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And then the Supreme Court begins to run the table on laws. When the Supreme Court says that federal judges can no longer consider new evidence, even if it shows that you're innocent, because wow. the laws have already been followed and you got a fair trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and I and I walk people through this stuff, and they act as if I'm speaking a foreign language, and I'm like, yo, y'all, that's light. They're going further. All these folks who are LGBT, oh, mm-hmm. don't think for a second the abortion ruling is the end. Oh, oh. Clarence Thomas made clear we going after contraception. We go after same sex marriage, and they're not going to stop. And then it's kind of like, well, no, there are other. I'm like, okay, y'all go ahead and play that game and see what happens. They're right. playing the long game, and that is to have entrenched power. That even when those numbers change and the major, the emerging minority becomes a majority, they still gonna control this sucker. Yeah, but you know, one of my favorite movies is the movie Judgment at Newark, right? Which is the trial of these Nazis. Uh, at the end of World War II, the Nuremberg Trials. Yep. But what people tend to forget is who are the Nazis that they were trying? They were trying the members of the German Supreme Court that had codified all of these crimes that you could be sterilized. You could be murdered with, uh, you know, a fentanyl shot into the heart. You could be uh, deported with all of your properties taken away from you. You could be mass murdered by the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, because they say so. Every law Hitler used was a law that was enforced by Hitler. But first, it required men of goodwill and faith and education to codify your mass murder. And that's what happened. And so, you know, it's, it's Roland, it, it's a shame because the people who are the ones that bug me the most are the people who hang out in my barbershop. Right? They're the ones who they think they have, you know, the street smarts and the street education, and they don't vote. And they don't care about voting. And they'll be out there talking about reparations, right? At a time, and, that, and, and, and the only thing that I can say is, is that when you try to educate them, they don't want to be educated, right? And so we have to harness the people who are willing to hear how bad it could really get. And that's what this book is. And that's why it's called They Want to Kill Americans. Who is the they? The they is your neighbors. The thing that, and I, so let's go back to 2016. I'll never forget uh, watching Michael Moore. He's on Morning Joe, and he's talking about how, you know, we need to understand these people, and we need to um, listen to them, and and, I, and and Bill Maher has been on this whole deal. You know, we 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 can't call them deplorables and 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 think that you know we've got to figure out how to get them on our side. R- really? Because again, if I replace these wh- fanatical white Christians with America's def- defining of fanatical Muslims, ain't it interesting how the conversation shifts? Oh, yeah. I mean, these, when I keep saying, you can't reason with these people. And the reason this 25, 30% is so dangerous is because of the other people who go, oh, uh, no, no, Malcolm Rowland, I, I don't agree with those things. Uh, I, I'm voting for, for the tax cuts. I'm, I'm voting for the strong defense. Right, right. I'm voting for, the, and not even realizing, no, 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 no. You and look, Eric Erickson and I, you know, he didn't support Trump in 2016, but he said he voted for him in 2020 uh, because of the Supreme Court. And I'm like, Eric, you cannot excuse the fact that you wanted January 6th to actually happen because you emboldened that. When you voted for him, what I said to Chris Christie, who was so offended, he thought I ambushed him on ABC, was you emboldened that. Don't, because I keep saying they are choosing. Power and party over principles, over morals, over values, over character. And that's what this boils down to. And human life. Yep. They would rather, there are so many of them out there. I love one of my, one of the most interesting things that occurred last year, the, the, the true indicator of how they felt was the guy in Oregon when he was talking with Charlie Kirk. And he says, when can we actually use our weapons? When can we use our guns? Why do we have these guns? When can we actually start killing people? Right? Th- that these weapons that they're buying by the tens of millions, the AR-15s, they're not talismans that they're just going to hang on the wall and put, you know, 
you know, bales of onions around and, 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 and worship or use as pop art. These are vehicles and tools that they would like to use. They're training wearing the same body armor and equipment I'm wearing in Ukraine to fight against Russia and Russian artillery. They're using that. They're buying it by thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of gear and Gucci weapons equipment to overthrow the American government. And in the 1860s, we didn't have this problem. Yeah, some guys had muskets and everything, but they actually had to raid the arsenals to get really good weapons. And believe me, at some point, someone's going to think that's a good idea down in the South, right? You, you know, maybe we should overrun, um, a, you know, a nuclear power plant or a nuclear trans weapons trans um, transit station like in Western, uh, Western Texas. You can get sovereignty with that. And it sounds crazy. I know I, you know, I don't like talking about things like this. I hate crazy scenarios. The problem is I have, I am not saying anything that is coming out of my head. Everything I say has come out of the mouth of some white supremacist neo-Nazi on their own forums, ideas on how to stop nuclear, how to seize nuclear bombs or get sovereignty in states which have you know, Air Force ballistic missiles. It's crazy talk. But guess what? It's crazy talk that is now being spoken in the polls of the Republican Party uh, and where they believe that they can now bring violence to their to uh, their fellow citizens because we're non-entities as far as they're concerned. I think what also bothers me immensely, uh, Malcolm, is this, this, this refusal to act as if we cannot, and again, when I say we, I ain't talking about black people, uh, <laughs> treat these folks as to who they are. This, this denying of the reality of white domestic terrorism, right. this notion that somehow all oh, doesn't exist. And I'm sitting there going, are y'all crazy? I'm like, what are you talking about? When the FBI director has repeatedly said that the number one threat internally is white domestic terrorism, they do not want to accept it, which then means that they don't want to use the proper legal authority. And, and, and I'm going to say it, and I don't care. Attorney General Merrick Garland, what the hell are you doing? That guy this, the, the, I'm sorry. The, the, the Department of Justice, in dealing with these white domestic terrorists, is being far too passive because the grave threat that these folks um, uh, pose to this country is enormous. Yeah. You know, they should have had a guy like Glenn Kirshner, right? one of our peers on MSNBC, who understands the gravity of the threat and would also understand the gravity of what it would mean for the attorney general to come out and say, we are going to now track you down. We're going to find you. If you're going to be out there plotting sedition, America will be defended. Well, that's not what we're getting out of the Justice Department. Here's what we're getting away. Oh, I can't get it. It's so soft because it doesn't exist. They're doing nothing. And if they are doing stuff by according to procedure, these procedures will end the United States. Right? Lawyers are too chummy. I don't know if you've ever been in the room with a group of lawyers from opposite political parties. They talk to each other and they ask, where'd you go to law school? Where did you clerk? Who did you work for? How much are you guys making in this place? They're chummy. To the point where Republican lawyers, though, are plotting the end of the United States publicly, and Democratic lawyers are looking to see if there's a law firm they can move over to. It's it's in, it's incestuous and crazy. So, um, what must folks be doing? What is because this is real. This is this, uh, folks. This is not a movie. This is this yeah. is not this ain't fiction. This thing is happening yes it is well <laughs> let me tell you i get asked this all the time when I, when i'm uh, around the states going in airports everybody says malcolm you know you're a military guy what kind of weapon should i be buying to prepare for the civil war what should i be doing you know they're preparing for civil war i need a gun i need a handgun no you don't all right yeah i collect firearms yeah i have a lot of military experience you do not need these the only thing we have that is the truest, most powerful, lethal weapon that we have is the collective voting of our community, right? 
They are literally overturning the laws to make sure blacks don't vote, and especially older blacks who go to church, that they don't vote. And they are doubling down on the, you know, bread and circuses so that young blacks are frustrated, right? And they only will vote when it's their own personal interest, but they don't want you voting at all. So if you don't vote, you're the idiot. You're the sucker. You're the mark because you have been played by the, you know, we used to make the joke in the movies, right? That there's the, the white guy who's controlling everything in the government, the man, right? Donald Trump is the man now. An entire political party exists to execute his will. And here's his will. He wants to peel off 20% of black men to vote for their own extinction. That's insane. That's insane. It's like chickens voting for Colonel Sanders, right? You, any black man that says, well, you know, maybe Donald Trump has it right. You're an ignorant fool. My family did not run away from slavery in 1864 to join the Union Army and then serve nonstop for 150 years because you're stupid. We did it so that we give you the opportunity to not be stupid and to understand your vote is the only weapon you have. It's the only weapon you have. And if you think you're just going to sit on your hands, okay, you may as well be like those 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 people in the TV show, um, um, you know, the zombie show, uh, Walking Dead, where, you know, they would go to these signs, they would follow these signs during the zombie apocalypse, and they would find a camp of survivors, and it turns out the survivors were cannibals, okay? You're food to them. And you are, if you don't vote, you're the sucker and the idiot they want to see. They want you at home. They want you to say it's too difficult. They want you to say it's a procedure and that it's something that's going to oppress you because black people never da, da, da. We fought for this. Martin Luther King died for this. Died for this. So I think that, Roland, we really, really have to understand it's not about guns. It's about one slip of paper and one hour out of your life per year. And I have those who say, um, and look, I absolutely understand frustration for people who want to see significant change politically and who want Democrats to do more. Uh, but what I keep saying is, well, you can't sit your ass at home and not, I, mean, I literally had somebody um, 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 uh, who um, who sent me, uh, who said today, uh, uh, one of these FBA people, uh, don't vote blue no matter what in November. <laughs> and I'm like, you have no idea You're what, what these people across the aisle have in store. When you have uh, those senators, Hawley, Langford, Kennedy, Cruz, Cornyn, and the craziness that they will unleash in the Senate if they get control, and then Jim Jordan being the chair of a committee, if they control the House, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, if she doesn't lose still there and, and, and a Bobert, I'm like, you have got to be out of your mind to mm -hmm. act as if um, uh, you're not going to vote. These people are deranged. And I evil. know they're deranged. But you know what? They're also handled assets. These are people, they have been framed into all this silliness. And then, you know, I get a lot of interesting, now that I'm, I'm working in Ukraine, I was fighting in Ukraine, I suddenly had all these people from Brazil and Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia coming up and insulting me. And I realized these are paid shills. They get paid $25 from Moscow to come and try to discredit me. And they exist in the United States. There's black people that do this too. So. Oops. Uh, first of all, it's a book that you need to read. It's not as if Malcolm uh, wasn't on the money uh, with his previous <laughs> books. I'm never uh, wrong. <laughs> as, you, as you said, uh, Malcolm, uh, it, it's understand, it, it's, it's listening to people who are in intelligence, who do this uh, for um, a living, and whose job is to, is to not actually pay attention to what's happening right now, but to actually uh, focus on 
what is about to happen, what's going to happen in the next year, two years, five years. Uh, the book, They Want to Kill Americans, The Militias, Terrorists, and Deranged Ideology of the Trump Insurgency. Uh, Malcolm, always good to see you. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Josiane, our dear friend, uh, sent, me, uh, sent me a text. She said, tell Malcolm to get a haircut. <laughs> Got to get to that barbershop. I, it's not scheduled in my book tour. I uh, got what was well, see you gotta do like you gotta have a barber come to your hotel room. So all just right, tell me right. just, just tell, tell me what city you in, and then I'll hit up uh some brothers who know how to who are mobile haircutters. <laughs> Malcolm, right, I appreciate man. it. Thanks a lot, man. Stay safe. Take care. Love all you. Right, peace. Bye-bye.